What's up, guys? How you doing? Mr. Gates here. Happy Thursday. Uh, a couple of reminders before we talk about the invention of the cotton gin. First of all, the reading that I assigned this week about Eli Whitney's invention, the cotton gin, is due today. Um, you know, it won't be marked late as long as you finish it by the end of the day. So you have the two-page cotton gin reading with 10 questions. Use complete sentences. This was a reading comprehension quiz grade when I assigned it last year in a regular class. Um, for you guys at home, I'm going to uh, grade it as if it's a large homework assignment. Also, a reminder that the rubric, the instructions... And the project topics are on OneNote. There are people that have not uploaded their project yet. To do so, you are going to the Schoology Media album and submitting. So today, to begin the Cotton Gin, we are going to watch a short YouTube video. And then I'm going to discuss how that invention changed America. Because today is our last lesson of the Industrial Revolution topic. And we are getting ready to head into the causes of the Civil War. We'll talk about the expansion of slavery. We'll talk about the abolitionists. We'll talk about people like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And then as we approach the end of the year, we'll be getting into Abraham Lincoln and things that he did to try to prevent the split between the North and the South. So let's watch the uh, short YouTube video first. In the South, Tobacco was the main cash crop in the 18th century. Raising tobacco was very labor intensive, which created a demand for slaves. But toward the end of the 18th century, the tobacco market began to decline. As the southern plantation owners grew less tobacco, fewer slaves were required, which caused a drop in the price of slaves. Many people anticipated a future without slavery in America. But all of this changed with the invention of the cotton gin in 1783. Eli Whitney was an inventor who focused primarily on reducing the cost of manufacturing by making rifles with interchangeable parts. On a boat to South Carolina, he met the widow of Nathaniel Green, a famous general in the American Revolution, and was invited to come to her house. Well, there, he learned of the problems associated with growing cotton. Cotton was not grown very often because its production was very labor intensive. In addition to the usual labor to produce a crop, in cotton, the seeds needed to be separated out so that it could be used as a fiber to make fabric. This was a very time-consuming process, and workers could only clean about one pound of cotton a day. There was a rising market for fibers for fabric because of the growth in the textile industry, both in America and in the North. With the amount of labor required, cotton was not cost-effective, so wool was used instead. After Whitney was told about these problems, he was asked to try to invent a machine to automate the cleaning process. His resulting machine, the cotton gin, short for engine, was able to produce 50 pounds a day, the work of 50 men. The machine was not as successful for Whitney. His patent was ignored and his machine copied and his cotton gin company went out of business because of the cost of legal battles to enforce his patent. The cotton gin had a huge impact on the South. Cotton went from being an expensive product to produce to a very profitable venture. The South's climate and soil was suited to cotton, so once the cotton gin was invented, much of the South switched to its production to fill the mills of England and the North. With the new viable cotton market, the demand for slaves was reignited along with the desire to keep the institution. Because of the high worldwide demand for cotton, new fields were cleared and planted and this required more unskilled labor, which the slavery system provided. Even though the cotton gin reduced the labor involved, it actually increased the work for slaves. Now that there were mass producing cotton, they still needed slaves to plant and cultivate the cotton and to pick it once it was ripe. Cotton worked well with corn because the picking and planting times were different. So when the slaves were done planting corn, it was time to plant cotton. When they were done harvesting corn, they harvested the cotton. Because of the costs associated with producing wool, the cotton gin did not decrease the price of cotton. Even though it became much easier to produce, the demands from Britain and New England rose. Soon the South began to rely so much on cotton as their cash crop, they began to call it King Cotton. 
the South produced 75% of the cotton in the whole world. They believed that if the North attacked them, Britain would come to their aid because without their cotton, English industries would collapse and those industries would put pressure to support the South. It didn't end up turning out as they had hoped and expected. All right, so we're going to cut that off there. Um, so one thing about today, I don't have a new worksheet for you guys to complete between the project and this reading comprehension. You've had a lot of work this week, so I'm just finishing up with a video explaining some of the stuff I wanted to explain about the cotton gin. So let's begin with this slide here. It's a great picture of the cotton gin. In that picture, it kind of looks like popcorn on the bottom. That's actually the seeds that have been removed from the cotton. The way I always describe this is imagine you're a kid who's it, at the park eating cotton candy and you drop it on the ground. It gets dropped in the dirt, bunch of twigs, bunch of grass. That cotton candy is, you know, yummy delicious, but it's also very sticky. Removing the dirt the seeds and the grass from that cotton candy so that it would be clean and ready to eat would take you forever. It would be nearly impossible. Now, cotton candy is not made from cotton. It's actually made from sugar. But that example helps you understand how difficult it is to remove seeds from real cotton, which grows on the plant. The seeds are sticky and a bit prickly and they're small. And they get, you know, they're stuck deep down at the core of the cotton fiber, the way apple seeds are at the core of an apple. So they, you know, they described that it was so labor intensive that it almost wasn't worth it to grow cotton because of the amount of time and the difficult work, you know, that these uh, slaves working on plantations had. Eli Whitney, being an inventor, wants to help them. And when he was hired or challenged to build a machine that made it easier, his original goal was to help slaves, you know, and he wanted to make their job easier. Unfortunately, and this is what today's quick little lesson is about, unfortunately, his invention leads to a huge boom, a skyrocket in slavery in America because cotton becomes so profitable. You can see that between 1790 and 1860, slavery increases six times. That means, you know, if we went from, I'll pick a, a round number, if we went from uh, 100,000 slaves in Virginia in 1790, by 1860, the year before the Civil War starts, the number had r risen up to about 600,000 slaves. I just picked random numbers, but slavery grew tremendously during those decades. The slave trade would increase. More and more slaves are being brought into the southern states. You can see the actual numbers here. We estimate 687,000 slaves in the United States in 1790. By the beginning of the Civil War, there were almost 4 million. And three out of every four slaves, that's 75%, were working in agriculture, which means working on farms. Um, so the cotton gin worked. It was a simple machine. First of all, the, the, the name cotton gin is a shortened nickname for cotton engine. You could imagine a guy in the South in 1790 saying cotton engine. And just with that strong, heavy Southern accent, the name of the machine went from cotton engine to cotton gin, which was just a nickname for the machine. One interesting thing about Eli Whitney, he did not make a lot of money from his invention. He had issues with his patent. He had legal problems. He and his partners, I believe they say, grossed about $90,000 from the invention. But, you know, as the cotton gin grows and grows and, and cotton expands to become this billion dollar industry in the United States, Eli Whitney didn't really knock him dead from his invention. He made a small amount of money uh, because his patent, I believe, ran out and, uh, and those legal problems cost him the opportunity for future, future profit. And so how does the machine work? It basically works like a hairbrush. You see it says it uses a combination of wire screen and small wire hooks to pull the cotton through the screen. So the way you would uh, 
you know, use a hairbrush to maybe remove fibers or, um, you know, like I use my cotton candy example, maybe to pick dirt or leaves off your dog, you know, your dog's fur. The cotton gin has these small wire hooks and small wire screens and small wire brushes that pull the cotton fibers through and what would be left behind would be the seeds, which are what you want to remove. The clean cotton fibers would then be, you know, bundled up or bushled up or packaged up and shipped off to northern factories where in those textile mills they're using the cotton fibers to make fabric. Um, and then just to finish up, we'll t- we're going to get into slavery again. That's our next topic. We'll, we'll really begin focusing on how the cotton gin and the expansion of slavery become a cause of the Civil War. As cotton becomes the number one crop in America, 55% of the slaves in America worked on cotton fields. You can see other crops like sugar and rice were you know, key slavery crops as well in the South. Um, Not all slaves worked on farms. They estimate around 15% worked as domestic servants, which would mean slaves working inside of homes. And another 10% of slaves worked in trade and industry. So maybe working as a carpenter or a blacksmith, maybe loading up ships for trade. However, cotton was king. And as the video said, the Cotton Kingdom, the nickname for the southern states, the Cotton Kingdom really becomes the, you know, the industry, the, the financial backbone of the United States. Those yellow states, those are states that grew cotton. It's the warmest southern states. That was where the cotton belt was, stretching from present-day Texas all the way across the south, touching states like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, and North Carolina even reaching up a little bit into, you know, middle states like Tennessee and a lot of Arkansas. Those states become the wealthiest farming states in the U.S. Uh, Texas doesn't become a state until the 1840s. That was, you know, cotton's glory days. By those decades before the Civil War, if you look at the years, the Civil War begins in 1860, Those years in between, cotton becomes a billion-dollar industry. It becomes the number one crop in the world. The United States is the number one cotton-producing country in the world. Uh, Two-thirds of the cotton being grown in the South is being shipped off to the world. So countries like Europe relied on the United States cotton. And the northern states also relied on United States cotton. So as we finish up our industrial revolution unit, one of the first inventions we talked about, the cotton gin, which was invented at the beginning. You know, Eli Whitney's invention was, I believe, 1787. I might have the year wrong. Maybe 1793. It was early on. It has huge ramifications for U.S. history, which means it leads to major change. If you remember your project, Transforming the World, This one transforms the world more than anything. You know, these cotton states will do anything to protect their livelihood, their business, their their millions and billions. And uh, and disagreements between the North and South are eventually going to lead to the Civil War. The Southern states are going to try to break away. There's going to be a bloody war fought that lasts uh, five years and cotton changes changes the course of history. So uh, so that's Eli Whitney and his cotton gin. Um, if you are done with the invention project and you are done with the reading, you are uh, pretty much done for the week. We're going to have our Friday check-in again tomorrow. Uh, I want to see everybody. I want to check in and make sure that, uh, that you're keeping up with the work. You guys that are here till the end are the ones that are keeping up with your work. I know that. Um, Just a reminder, the fourth marking period is regular grading now, numerical grades. So when I say something is being graded, that is a grade that's going to uh, directly, you know, affect your fourth marking period grade. So keep up the good work. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow at the Friday Google Meet check-in. But for now, have a great day and look forward to, uh, to being in touch.